Sometimes, a great disruption can occur simply by flipping the script, by looking at the other side of the coin. Today, you're going to meet an entrepreneur who did exactly that, and in the process, empowered writers to share their words with the world. From the edges of publishing, it's Disruptor, celebrating the rebels, mavericks, and weirdos of the publishing industry, and encouraging each of you to disrupt in your own way. Now, here's your host, John Bard. Greetings, one and all. I'm John Bard. Welcome to Disruptor, episode 11, with Ricardo Fayette of Readsy.com. I've been in the publishing world for close to 30 years, and I've seen a lot of things change, but maybe they haven't changed fast enough. And so I asked the question, are there disruptors out there? Are there people and companies that are really changing things in publishing, pushing us into the future, throwing out the old rule book and creating a new one all their own? I went in search of that, and I found them. And every week here on Disruptor, you'll meet them. Welcome to the journey. It's time to disrupt. Today's episode of Disruptor is brought to you by Writing Blueprints, the breakthrough step-by-step system for writers that creates truly great books. To learn more about the most disruptive way ever to become a successful author, visit writingblueprints.com and use the code DISRUPT to save 10% off everything on the site. The writing world has been shaken. Meet the earthquake. Go to writingblueprints.com and use the code DISRUPT to save 10%. Writing Blueprints. This is how you write a book. As the digital and self-publishing revolution has continued, much has been made about the meaning of it all for readers. How will they find the books they want? How will they buy it? And how will they read this material? But a group of young entrepreneurs flipped the script and simply asked, what does this mean for writers? They immediately identified that there was great frustration for writers who wanted to self-publish and publish digitally because everything was so decentralized. They created one site where writers can find everything they need. It's called readsy.com, and it's changing the face of self-publishing. I spoke with one of those young entrepreneurs, Ricardo Fayette, about Readsy and about what comes next. Welcome, Ricardo, from Readsy.com. I'm really been looking forward to having the opportunity to chat with you today. Thank you, John. It's a pleasure to, to be on the show. Let me begin the way we always start uh, all of our discussions with folks. You know, we do celebrate the rebels, mavericks, and weirdos of the publishing world. Which one of those words best fits you and why? Yeah, I've never been really one for, for, for words. Um, I, I'd have to go with Maverick probably out of the three, mostly because because uh, I don't think I'm a rebel and I don't think I'm a weirdo either. So that's one choice left. Right, a process of elimination. We'll do that. <laughs> For the folks who don't know Reedsy, um, give me just a brief description of exactly what Reedsy is. So Reedsy, at its core, is uh, a marketplace connecting authors with the top publishing talent in the industry. So think uh, editors, from developmental editors down to proofreaders, um, cover designers, book illustrators, um, publicists, marketers, website designers to design the author's website. Pretty much anyone, uh, an author or, or a book publisher, would need to hire at any, po- at any point throughout the, um, the publication and marketing process of the book. When you, and I know you, you had co-creators, when you sat down to conceive this, what was the disruption that you were trying to make in the publishing industry? So there was already um, a huge disruption in the publishing industry at the time, um, caused, caused mostly by Amazon and introduction of the, of the ebook formats and the rapid adoption of the Kindle and other um, e-reader devices. Uh, and that had already... Uh, like that had changed our lives, me and my co-founders, because we started reading a lot on, um, on e-readers. I personally read on my phone. I started reading all my books on my phone. Uh, I know people say they hate that, but it, it works for me. Um, 
my co-founder Emmanuel um, and friend, uh, he used to import his Kindles from across the pond because we were living in France and they weren't selling them there. And so we're really already adopted of that and we're thinking what, what does it mean for the for the author side, for the publishing side, because uh, obviously it's a big change for the for the readers, but like what does it mean for the authors and the publishers and the agents and all that? And we started learning about self-publishing. So there was already a huge disruption at play uh, with the eruption of um, eBooks and the eruption of self-publishing. Authors were publishing their books themselves. And so naturally the question we had was, um, it's great that they're publishing the books themselves, but there's a lot more to publishing a book than just writing it and uploading it on Amazon. Like there's people doing the editing, the design, and all that. So we started thinking, who does that for these self-publishing authors? And we found out that there was a space for kind of a marketplace that would connect them and like freelance professionals, like cover designers, editors, marketers, who were increasingly, yeah, freelance. Um, so that's, that's where the disruption, I think, um, opportunity was. It was in connecting... Um, two market trends, one self-publishing, author self-publishing, and the other one, uh, editors, designers, and a bunch of professionals who used to be in-house at the publishers and who were increasingly going freelance. And we thought, okay, it's a great opportunity for kind of marketplace connect, to connect these people. You know, one of the things that, that we've done in our own business and, and a lot of the folks that we talk to on Disruptor are doing is promoting what I'm calling the democratization of, of publishing. It's taking publishing control out of the hands of gatekeepers and putting it into the hands of authors, which is a wonderful thing in theory and often in practice, but let's talk for a minute about gatekeepers and why they were there in the first place and whether bypassing them entirely is, is always the best thing. How, how do people make up for the lack of the sort of curation that a publisher does when an editor you know sees 20 manuscripts maybe one of them might spark her interest maybe none of them maybe one out of a hundred might spark her interest because she's 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 read lots of manuscripts she knows what's good what's not what's what will sell what won't an author on his or her own doesn't really know that so how do you make up for um for the lack of that gatekeeper without just putting a glut of of really poorly created content out into the world <laughs> It's a tough question. Um, I think, I think more than, or, or rather, on top of democratizing publishing and allowing everyone to just like put the story out there, no matter how, how good, how well produced, or how relevant it is. Um, self publishing has also created a way for a very, very um, niche audiences to find books for them. Um, so on the one hand, yeah, you have a lot of lot of bad stuff that comes on the market. And, and in fact, like probably 90% or 80, 90% of stuff that gets self-published is probably read by just two, three people. Uh, but there's also a, a huge part of um, self-publishing that's just authors writing in a, for a very small niche and being able to reach that niche. When in the past, um, publishers who are obviously larger companies uh, interested in in, in scaling, interested in making as much money as possible on a title, we're only going to look for what they call commercial titles. So titles with a huge commercial potential. Um, and I think that's one of the really positive ways about, uh, really positive things about self-publishing is this niche effect. Uh, and in, in a way, the reader becomes uh, the curator. If, if you put a book out that has that is either badly produced, badly written, unedited, or with bad cover design, or is professionally produced but isn't write, written for a market or doesn't really have a market, um, then you're not going to sell, basically. And that book might be out there and just uh, create a content glut, but effectively, no one's going to see it. So it's not really going to be a big deal. It's just going to cost Amazon a couple dollars a month to, to host it on their servers. That's it. That's it. Mm -hmm. So when folks, the folks who come to ReadZ, are they typically people who are writing for niches, people who are writing for you know, easily defined and easily reached markets, or are they people who are putting out poetry, couple, you know, anthologies or, you know, simple books that maybe will just sit there and not sell? Who, who, who are the folks that are coming to you? Uh, there's a bit of everything, uh, to be honest, and it's really hard to give percentages because we really don't categorize people. We Obviously, we don't ask them when they sign up. Are you just 
going to publish a book that no one's going to read or are you actually going to publish a book that someone's going to read? Right. Um, but I'd say that since we really have top professionals on the website, so they're expensive. Like it's the higher end of the market. Um, so if you're going to spend maybe two, three thousand dollars on editing, as you should, if you're serious about your book, um, then you probably have high hopes that your manuscript actually has a lot of commercial potential and that you're going to make your money back. So I'd say a majority of our authors are actually have this goal of writing full time um, or at least of putting out a book that's going to enable them to make a living out of whatever other activity uh, they do. If it's nonfiction, it's often books to support uh, a business uh, or some form of coaching that they're trying to develop. Generally speaking, who, who are the people who are coming to you? Do you kind of have a sense of, of the age group, the demographics, uh, you know, who, who they are? Um, it's, it hugely varies. It hugely varies. Uh, obviously, the main demographics, I mean, it's going to be mostly people in their late 30s to late 60s, probably. Um, we know that our number one genre is fantasy. Uh, and our number two genre is probably um, either science fiction or romance or memoir. Um, but we also have a lot of self-help, um, a lot of business. Uh, we're slightly more fiction than nonfiction, probably 60-40. But as I said, it, it, it's very different also because since the very beginning, we wanted to be all-inclusive on the, on the author side, basically. We wanted to uh, have editors and designers and people, professionals on Read C for um, children's books authors, for newbie authors, for experienced authors, for even for traditional publishers. We have uh, several traditional publishers and some of them pretty big who use Read C to find um, freelance editors and designers because, again, they outsource most of that, even the publishers. Mm -hmm. um, so we have all kinds of... Uh, all kinds of clients because we're able to build a supply uh, editors, designers, all the freelancers who would be able to match all kinds of supply, uh, all kinds of demand. When you sat down with your, your co-founders and started developing this, were there other platforms or other businesses that you look to for inspiration? Yeah, I think any other marketplace out there we look to for inspiration because marketplace dynamics are, are fairly similar, whether you're, you're, you're building a, a car sharing app or a vacation house rental app or, or a marketplace like Ritzy. Um, obviously, I think some of our design inspiration came from or looking at Airbnb. A lot of our legal inspiration come from, came from Airbnb as well. We took a look, obviously, at generalist marketplaces like Upwork, Fiverr, Freelancer.com that in some way are competitors because they also have editors and designers on them. They're just not really focused on publishing and they don't vet their freelancers very well. Um, so yeah, we, we, we took a look at almost all the marketplaces out there that we could see synergies and in, in how they operated uh, and that we could take inspiration from. One of the things that I thought was interesting on your site is the, I write because mm -hmm. concept where you're asking people to basically explain why they're writing. What are you learning from that? Yeah, that was a one-time campaign we ran, uh, which, which worked really well. What we learned from that, not, we didn't learn anything really new from the, fact, from, from the motivations for writing because we, we'd been running for a few years already and we knew, we knew that the motivations for writing vary a lot. They can, uh, one of the first questions if you sign up to your website, uh, one of the first questions in our, in our onboarding is what do you write and also why do you write basically and what, what your plans are. And, and we get a lot of answers to that, to that, to that automated email. And, and I used to read basically all of them uh, in the early days. And that's when you see that the motivations for writing just vary enormously, enormously. But yeah, to go back to the I Read Because campaign, we wanted to, we'd been running for a few years, we're doing well and we wanted to give back. And so we partnered with a charity, um, Room to Read. And we thought it'd be cool to kind of um, do something both philanthropic and also with a potential of scale on social media uh, and ask people, okay, send us a short video of like why you write. Because we think that's a question that a lot of authors like answering. Uh, and for every video that an author sends us, it can be whomever, super successful author or just like debut author. For every video that we get, we'll donate $10 to Room to Read. 
And that would run really well. We got a lot of submissions, a lot of videos, and a lot of buzz around it. And yeah, even people like you who 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 interview me maybe two years after it, they, they still find it and still mention it. So that's pretty cool. Well, it's interesting because in our business, we do the same thing. We always ask people when they come on board with us, who are children's writers primarily, why they write. Right. And it's always, it is always interesting to, to hear that because they're usually different than what you might expect. You know, a lot of people might expect, well, I'm writing, you're going to get a lot of people saying, I want to make a living or I want to earn extra money or whatever. But it's, it really almost always comes from a heart place. It always comes from, I have, I have something inside me that, that needs to get out. That probably has never changed. Absolutely. I think for children's books, what we get a lot is parents who find that they wanted a certain, they wanted to find a certain kind of children's book for, for their child and they didn't find it. So they kind of started telling their child stories and the child liked it. They wrote the stories down. Other parents liked them and they thought, okay, this book needs to be out there. And I think that's actually one of the main reasons people write and end up some publishing is that they look for a certain type of story out there or for a certain type of book out there and they don't find it and they think, hey, I can write it. I can write it and I can publish it myself. Uh, and if there are other people like me out there who think this kind of book should be out there, they might find it, they might buy it and who knows, I might uh, make some money out of it. Based on what you've seen in terms of people who've come to Z and, and you've maybe followed their progress a little bit, what kind of advice would you have for someone who is just starting the self-publishing journey? What are the things they really need to focus on to create a successful book? I think, I think I should spend a lot of time on the writing, on the writing process. And a lot of people think, hey, I'm just going to write a book and forget that writing is just like, I like to compare it to playing a musical instrument because no one wakes up one day and says, hey, I'm going to be a, a world star guitar player by this time next year, you know? Uh, whereas a lot of people think, hey, I'm going to write a book and I'm going to be the next J.K. Rowling by this time next year. <laughs> and, and I'm sorry, but it takes a lot of skill. Uh, writing is a skill. It's something that you, that you might have some talent for, but it's something that you learn. Um, so I, I don't recommend necessarily taking writing courses, but I do recommend writing a lot, writing regularly, having a discipline for writing. Um, taking, reading uh, a lot of writing, buying books on plotting, on story structure, on characterization, on dialogue, on all the aspects of writing. We've got a ton of free courses at ReadC, on ReadC as well, um, on, that we call ReadC Learning, that cover all these aspects. And then either, yeah, either taking a writing course or working with an editor, because um, working with an editor is not just about publishing your book, it's about learning stuff about writing that you would never learn otherwise. It's like, it's both polishing your book and taking a one-on-one -on -one course on writing with someone who knows everything there's to know about it. Also make sure that there's a market for your book because I see too many people writing, this goes to all the memoir writers out there, um, all the people who think they have an original idea for a story. Do make some research and make sure that there's not like, 50,000 other books out there about like uh, a memoir on addiction or something like that. Right. Which again, yours could be unique, but in order to know that you need to at least read some of the other ones and know why yours is unique. Right. What, as you guys look to the future of Readsy, what's on your wish list? What would you like to develop into? Um, the, there's something that I really want to do is help authors on the marketing side of things more. Um, because we do think that more and more publishing is becoming about marketing, really more than, sometimes more than writing. Uh, a, an author with the right marketing skills is going to be able to make a living off, out of writing, whereas someone who is just really, really good writer, but not necessarily marketing savvy, might struggle a lot, or is, is actually going to struggle a lot. So we do have, we have marketers on the, on the Ritzy marketplace that you can hire, but I don't think that's necessarily always the best option. So we're trying to find some new avenues, whether that's through, through courses, through content, or through technological tools to help authors market their books more easily and to help the, the cream rise to the top, if, if that's even possible in today's, uh, in today's content glut. Yeah. 
Do you find, uh, and now this is us coming from, you know, we've been in here for 30 years doing this. And so when we started working with children's writers, the idea of a self-published book was, uh, was really looked down upon. Self-published books had a, had a real stigma and for good reason for, uh, for in many cases, but they were, you know, vanity presses and, and there were people that were just putting out stuff and they weren't selling them. That's obviously changed dramatically. Do you think that self-published books are now accepted considering, you know, especially those that are well-written, well-designed, well-created are accepted on the same footing as traditionally published books? Yes, and that's because I think that the people who don't accept them on the same footing are just a, a very small minority nowadays. Uh, it's even four years ago, it was easy to come to find comments on Facebook groups or in the press or wherever about like, yeah, self publishing is not for me, or I don't read self published books or things like that. Uh, nowadays, it's hard to find them. You find them here and there, but not that often. I think the few places that are still actively discriminating against um, indie books are traditional PR, traditional media, uh, oftentimes because the same people who own the big media outlets are the same people, are the people who own the, the big publishing companies. Uh, so they, they kind of want to feature the books published by those big publishing companies rather than by indie, by indie authors. And bookstores, sometimes it's, I think, yeah, I think the, the advantage of going through a traditional publisher nowadays uh, is PR and bookstores and, present, and presence in physical bookstores. Uh, so that's the two main places that still discriminate against indie books, sometimes because they have vested interests to do so. And more often because they just, there's just a lot of self-published books and saying I just look at books that come from traditional publishing is a very easy way to curate basically it's not a great way to curate but it's a very easy way to curate yeah. as you kind of just look down the road at publishing in the book world say five or ten years down down the road what do you see anything interesting that's different than what we might see in the landscape now it's it's I hate looking at ten, year, ten years time in, in publishing because if you'd ask anyone the qu this question 10 years ago, I think no one would have predicted what's happened. Uh, in the immediate future, like there are a lot of questions, what's gonna happen with Barnes and Noble, what's gonna happen with Amazon. Um, in 10 years time, I think it's, it's even possible that Amazon will have been disrupted by something else. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of talk about interactive reading. Uh, it still hasn't taken off, uh, even though we've been talking about it for several years. Uh, there's talk of like AI written books. Uh, again, no one's really been able to achieve that, thank God. Uh, <laughs> there's been a lot of talk around uh, augmented reality. Audio is on the rise, but how far is it going to go? I think, I think audio is definitely going to keep growing. And I think we're going to get to a point, I think more importantly, more, more people are going to be reading. Mm -hmm. That's what we've seen, the increasingly positive trend that we've seen in the recent years is that more people read. And we're expecting that that wasn't going to happen because of video games, because of TV, because of all these uh, distractions. But in the end, more and more people read nowadays. Um, and especially on, among the younger demographics, I think that's the one positive thing that I can see happening uh, in the next 10 years. It's more people reading. And whatever form they read in, whether it's ebooks, whether it's print books, whether it's um, short format on their phones, like it's happening in Asia, um, whether it's audio, all kinds of consumption of content are great for, for content creators in the end. Let me uh, end this with the, the question we always end with. Who's your favorite disruptor in history? It could be someone living, someone dead, anyone that comes to mind. I think an easy answer is Jeff Bezos because I'm like, we, we love um, we love hating Amazon. It's, it's, it's a thing we, lo we, we love doing. Amazon is now what Barnes & Noble was maybe 20 years ago. Outside from the book world, where I think they've done amazing things in the book world, but outside from the book world, they're a company that's basically brought any kind of product to your doorstep wherever you live, uh, especially in the US. And I think thinking from the perspective of someone who lives in the Midwest in a very remote town, knowing that they can get any 
important product or something that they would really need without having to drive miles. Um, and just in a question of hours or days, it's just life changing for a lot of people. Um, and not only have they brought prices down, they've, they've also brought, they've also made it incredibly convenient um, and useful. And obviously I have a lot of reservations about how they operate as a company, about the silos, about a lot of things that they're doing. Uh, but I think if we look at the overall picture, they've done more good um, than a lot of other companies out there that are the disruptors of the 21st century. Great. How can folks learn more about Reedsy? What's a good first step? A uh, good first step is to go to reedsy.com, R-E-E-D-S-Y.com. We like to think our landing page uh, explains pretty well what we do. Uh, there's also a contact button, um, so you can reach out to us there, and we're always happy to give you more info on Reedsy. Uh, and I also encourage everyone to check out our blog, um, which is blog.reedsy.com, a separate domain, because there's all our free content there. Uh, we publish several blog posts a week. As I mentioned, we've got free courses on all the aspects of writing, publishing, marketing. We've got almost 50 free courses now. We do, we do free webinars uh, with our professionals from the marketplace. We try to create as much content as possible for free because we want to encourage authors to, to learn on their own so that they only spend money on hiring the people that they really need to hire. So that's editors, designers, sometimes marketers, very rarely publicists. And we don't want authors, we basically don't want authors paying companies to do, it, to do everything for them because we think that really works out in the end. Uh, you're rarely successful in that case. Uh, if you put everything in the hands of the company, you're just like, okay, it's, I don't need to take care of this anymore, then your book's probably not gonna sell. So we wanna encourage authors to learn a lot, to spend a lot of hard work and time learning uh, with our free resources so that they're better equipped to then publish their book and make use of our paid professionals. Well, thanks for hanging out with us today, Ricardo. It was, uh, it's really interesting to learn about kind of self-publishing being, being brought under control a little bit. Because, <laughs> you know, it's really all about empowering authors. That's what we're about. And, and the opportunity to pick and choose and put together your own team is truly a, an act of empowerment. So I think what you guys are doing is, is just tremendous. Awesome. Thank you so much for, for inviting me. Today's episode of Disruptor was brought to you by Writing Blueprints, the breakthrough step-by-step -step system for writers that creates truly great books. To learn more about the most disruptive way ever to become a successful author, visit writingblueprints.com and use the code DISRUPT to save 10% off everything on the site. The writing world has been shaken meet the earthquake. Go to writingblueprints.com and use the code DISRUPT to save 10%. Writing Blueprints. This is how you write a book. For show notes and videos, go to disruptcast.online. And to start a disruption of your own, visit writingblueprints.com to discover the most innovative and coolest way ever to write a great book. We'll be back next week. Until then, go forth and disrupt.